I'm rather excited about this presentation. It's the first time that we've given an open one. We've been given absolutely loads and loads of these to uh, individuals who've been uh, interested in the Pelican system. Um, I must say I'm quite practiced at giving them now, um, but I'm doing it a little bit differently this time because it's a, a little less interactively. Anyway, glad you can all hear me. Uh, and let's get going. So uh, the order of the presentation is for the first 15 minutes, I'm going to give you a little bit of background about, uh, about the Pelican system. Um, uh, it's a PowerPoint presentation. Uh, unfortunately, you can hear that. Um, I have to mute people as they're coming along. So, <laughs> right, that'll, right. So the presentation is going to be 15 minutes of background, um, a PowerPoint uh, slide because it's easier to explain some of the concepts with Pelican um, uh, with, with a PowerPoint slide rather than in the software itself. I want to talk about the Pelican system a little bit, um, why our Pelican system is fully quantitative and some of the other aspects that make it really very unique. And I also want to mention, because um, what's one of the key things that people ask about is uh, the degree to which it can be customized. And I think that's easier to cover in, in just a couple of slides. Then I'm going to spend 30 minutes talking about the software. Uh, I'm going to introduce to uh, to those of you unfamiliar um, the idea of bow tie risk. Nearly everybody will understand the simple or quick risk, as we call them. Um, I'm going to talk about bow tie risk and how they are a really strategically um, great improvement in the way that we think about risks. I'm going to talk about dashboards. Uh, everybody wants to know how risks are reported. Um, so we'll talk about that uh, a little bit. And we'll talk about alerts and um, project in risk integration and spreadsheet risk integration. These are a couple of things that are, again, really unique and powerful to Pelican. Uh, and at the end, you, you write your messages uh, in, in the chat box, and I'll try and spend the last 15 minutes uh, taking questions from you. Okay, the Pelican system. Uh, first of all, uh, we've got uh, Pelican is a software as a service uh, web-based system. Uh, so you access it via your browser. And it has all sorts of different interfaces which are accessible um, through a menu system at the top. So this is the Pelican web-based system. Alongside the web-based system, you have desktop applications. Um, well, first desktop application is the project risk analysis software called Tamara, which you uh, can download uh, a copy of for free from our website. And this performs cost and schedule risk analysis on both MS Project and Primavera P6 files. Um, if you're familiar with uh, Oracle Pre uh, Primavera risk analysis or Safran Risk or any of the other um, applications, it, it's similar. Uh, a little bit uh, more advanced in the ways that it can describe risks uh, about a schedule. Um, but uh, its more unique features are that it can integrate with the Pelican system itself. So it can pull updated information about risks into Pelican, into Tamara, run a simulation on, on some schedules uh, for which those risks apply, and then it can send that information back into Pelican, which we'll see in a little bit. The other desktop application we have is called Model Risk. Uh, if you're familiar with uh, Crystal Ball um, or At Risk, then you'll be familiar with the ideas of Model Risk. Um, Model Risk also can be downloaded for free from our website. Um, both of these applications, Tamara for Project Schedule Risk and uh, Model Risk for Spreadsheet Risk, uh, they have two versions. The first version is, is the basic version, we call it, and the basic version is free. It, it, it's always free. Uh, you just have to update the license once a year. Um, and you can always switch that to the complete version. Complete version will last um, for uh, uh, a couple of, of uh, 
uh, weeks and then go back to the basic version. Now, what's very interesting about having this model risk software is that, first of all, you can take a, a risk analysis model that you've built in Excel using model risk, and you can upload that into Pelican. So you can make it available for any other users within the Pelican system, within the web browser. So on a tablet or on a PC, they don't need to have a copy of model risk running. And it will allow you to run different scenarios on these models. Not only that, but the risk analysis that you've done in Tamara for your projects, you can take the information from that and you can build them into your risk analysis model within Excel. And so in this way, we have a very integrated system. We also have an API that can import and export data if you want to connect to external databases and other applications. Um, for example, if you have a human resources data database where you want to uh, uh, integrate so that when you get a new employee, they can be automatically added into the Pelican system. So why did we build Pelican? Well, I've been a risk analyst for nearly 30 years now, and um, I noticed from the very beginning that there was a tendency when looking at risks to deal with them in a fairly qualitative way as uh, a background in mathematics and physics, um, the idea of talking about something as being low or high didn't really have much appeal to me. And so for many years, I've, I've dreamt of the idea that we would be able to have an integrated system would take all of the quantitative aspects we have in, in, in other different fields and be able to tie it all together into one and remove the ambiguity that comes with qualitative statements about risk. Now, I understand that it's very difficult sometimes to talk about the probability of something happening, but so people will often criticize a quantitative risk analysis by saying, if you've got a, we say the probability is low because, well, um, we, we don't know if it's 1% or 2% or something like that, so we just call it low. Yes, but low could also be 0.1% or 0.01%, and you know it's not that. So there is always a degree of precision that we can apply. And it's not that in risk analysis, we're really trying to be absolutely precise, but we're trying to get some sense that we've managed to uh, assess the risk fairly well. So we wanted to introduce numbers into risk management. What's wrong with qualitative risk analysis then? You will see a lot of uh, uh, software that's out there for that support um, risk management processes. Um, they will use a qualitative system. And it has the uh, advantage, in quote unquote, of being very simple. And typically it goes along the, the path of saying, well, we're have, gonna have two scales, one of them for the chances of something happening, and one of them for the magnitude of the impact if it happens. And from that, we also uh, often see things called heat maps. Heat maps are describing in red something that has got uh, it's very severe, it's very scary, it's got a high probability and a high impact. And then we have green, the color schemes, so these aren't so worrying. And those in the middle, well, we're not really sure. So what happens is that people will typically uh, enter risks into some sort of matrix like this, and they will say, well, it's got a mean, medium probability, and it's got a very high impact. There's risk number two. We, we plot it in here. The problem with this is that it's impossible to sum risks. Um, so you can't say that these three risks here, what, what do they, they total up to? We don't have a method for doing that. And even if you convert this into scores, where you go one, two, three, four, five, one, two, three, four, five on each scale, maybe you multiply them together. So this would be 25, and this would be one, and this would be two, and this would be four, et cetera. Even if you have that, you still can't use those scales for adding together risks to figure out what the complete exposure is. And that actually is very important. You want to know, for example, where all of those risks are really concentrated. Are, they, are the risks uh, more in one particular business or one particular project. And you cannot do that if you cannot add them all up. So we wanted to produce a system that would be able to add risks together. And that's a challenge because 
we wanted to be able to do it not just for financial. It's easy to say one dollar plus three dollars is four dollars. We wanted to be able to do it for other things, which progressively uh, uh, corporate corporations are becoming more interested in. So, for example, health and safety or environmental risk, of course, is going to be incredibly important in the future. Um, strategic risk and operational risks. Um, the, the risks that your operations will be uh, discontinued because you've had some IT breach or whatever. So we want to put all of these risks into one common framework and still allow you to be able to add and compare and to also at the same time be able to figure out when you apply control, is this control really going to be cost effective? The other thing that we wanted to be able to do is allow people to talk about risks that can repeat. So when you typically talk about a probability scale that goes from very low to very high, it sort of implies very high implies somewhere close to one, so 0.9 to 1 point naught. But you can have a lot of risks, like uh, you can have risk of, of a strike or, or of a tsunami or, or of a fire. You can have many risks that will occur several times. You can't talk about probabilities, you have to talk about the frequencies with which these things occur. And if you have a scale that basically has no end on the probability end side, you cannot have heat maps because at some point everything is red all the way up and you, you really can't distinguish. So we've avoided, and unapologetically, we've avoided including any sense of a heat map, uh, but we've allowed for a much greater flexibility in, in being able to talk about um, the chances of something happening. It also means when you talk about quantitative information, for example, um, that a risk occur, has a 20% chance of occurring, if you then look back historically at how often those risks actually did occur, if they only occur 10% of the time, you can say to yourself, you know, we tend to overestimate our risks or we tend to underestimate and, and if it's the opposite. And that means that you can validate something you really cannot do with uh, a qualitative system. And if you can validate, then you can improve. So over time, you get better at your estimates, you get a bit more precise, you, you've got a corporate learning that's going on. The trigger for demand, um, well, there's the technological trigger, which means that we now have, for example, Microsoft Azure and other um, service providers, which will give you software as a service platforms. This is making it far easier to produce uh, software as a service products. That's on the technical side, but for perhaps more importantly, on the regulatory side, we have ISO 31000. This in 2018 came up with a new version, um, which refocused on creating and protecting value as the, the purpose of risk management, rather than more of the compliance side of things, which is really what generated all of those GRC products that, that are out there in the market. So uh, we now know when we know that corporations want to follow regulations and if the regulations say that it should be quantitative, um, that's great. It means that they're more likely to look at the softwares that we're providing, hence we, we produce uh, Pelican. Um, we actually started this uh, about four years ago, so we're in advance, but um, we're glad to see that the, the regulatory world is, is catching up. We also have trends. We have people like John Wheeler at Gartner who is right rather vociferously talking um, on the web, on LinkedIn, etc., that GRC is dead. What has happened to GRC, and etc.? cetera? Um, they're, they're now saying that this uh, whole GRC system was really a big mistake. And then they're, they're talking about something that they're branding as integrated risk management. Um, it's essentially, it's, it's very, very similar to what we're producing in Pelican. And you also see some uh, influencers out there, um, Alexei Sidorenko on LinkedIn, myself, if you call me an influencer, um, Doug Hubbard, certainly. Um, Doug's been bashing on at people for years and years that you can do quantitative risk analysis. Um, it's how to measure nearly everything. Books are uh, very revealing about that. And I thoroughly encourage you to read them, as I encourage you to read Alexei Sidorenko's um, posts and his books, too. So why is Pelican new? Um, it's new because it inc incorporates a lot of different things that you will only have seen perhaps um, individual uh, software products and you certainly have never seen them um, integrated or fully quantitative. So risk registers, you of course, everybody's used to, this probably sitting in a spreadsheet somewhere in your company. Um, bowtie diagrams, this is a new way, which I'm gonna be describing quite a lot. 
um, for, allows you to strategically talk about how you might manage risk, why they might occur, the different consequences that can come out of them, the controls and mitigations that you can apply to ensure that these things don't happen. Bow ties are really fabulous because they they bring a lot more uh, critical thinking to how we, not just how we manage them, but how we even define risks. So people often mix up things like the difference between a risk event and a consequence. So for example, a risk event could be that um, you crash a car and there could be any number of different consequences from that. Um, consequence could be you lose your life or you lose your license or you go to prison or you kill somebody else. Um, lots of different consequences. Maybe you're just late for work. Well, you don't really want to say um, a risk is that I crash the car and I kill somebody. Another risk is I crash the car and I lose my license, etc., etc., etc. These all belong to a part of the same system. And with a bow tie uh, analysis, you can talk about the various different consequences that can come out of that risk event. And then we talk about how we can try and prevent that risk event from occurring in the first place and what if it does occur, what we can do afterwards. So for example, uh, wearing a seatbelt, that's a mitigation. If you do have a crash, then you're less likely to die. But uh, a control is you have an anti-lock braking system or you don't speed or you don't drink and drive, etc. Uh, as long, uh, alongside bow ties, which um, we're the first company ever to produce fully quantitative bow ties, and that's because it's pretty damn hard to do it. Um, we also um, have included uh, project cost and schedule risk um, and any type of risk modeling using uh, the, the model risk software, as I already talked about, and we've integrated it all together. We are first to ever achieve this correctly. Um, integration between quantitative tools is actually much more complicated than you might imagine. Um, there's a technical basis for it, but uh, it means that you need to be able to ensure that when you run Monte Carlo simulations, which we, we do within Pelican, that it, it's all completely uh, uh, connected together. So when it runs one particular scenario, if that scenario is a, a risk has occurred, all of the impacts of that risk, whether it's in a project schedule or it's in a spreadsheet model or whether it's in the financial analysis that's done within Pelican, it is all simulating that exact same scenario everywhere through the system. So even if you're on your desktop running an application, one of our applications, it will still use that same set of scenarios. And that wasn't a particularly easy thing to achieve, but we managed it. I just want to very quickly talk about how you get started with Pelican. I know that a lot of the GRC tools um, uh, are, are something of a nightmare. They take months to, to actually implement because there's a lot of customization. Well, we have a lot of customization within Pelican, but we've designed it from the beginning um, to be really easy to implement. It takes about one to two days to, to get going. Very first thing to do is you set up your entity structure. So an entity structure, you, you start with a corporate entity, then you start, um, you continue along, you talk about the different businesses and the different subdivisions, etc. You can work your way down any number of different entity levels. And the very end, you can have projects. A project is something that belongs to a particular entity. It has a start and finish, it has a number, a number of goals. After you've done that, you define the impact types that you care about. I've already pointed out that I think it's important that we go beyond simply financial risks. You can just do that if you want, but you might also talk for about, say for example, for a project, you might talk about delays. Uh, you might call in over the corporation, talk about health and safety, reputation, strategic, environmental, and you can add and remove any of these different uh, ty types of impacts that you want. So you can add your own impact. If, for example, you provide the, the electricity uh, network for a country, one of the key things you're going to want to talk about is the, um, the uptime for your network. You know, people without electricity is a key performance, so the thing that you really exist uh, to achieve. So you can add that into your system. And it may sound counterintuitive, but you can define whether these are quantitative or qualitative. We actually ultimately all bring everything down to a quantitative scale in a rather transparent way, which I won't really go into here, but uh, um, we do it. So some things are going to be quantitative, some things less so. So health and safety, you know, you, at one end of the scale, you might have somebody who's got a small scratch. At the other end of the scale, you might have many people who have died. Um, and this is not something that one that naturally falls on on a, a, a numerical scale, but we do we do manage conversion at the end, as I'll explain. Then you provide your risk appetite. Uh, again, this is a part of the system after you defined each of the impact types, and this is essentially how it, we come down to achieve a singular scale. And you can either use um, the, uh, the the 
the default descriptions that we provide, or you can write your own or use them as a guideline and make some edits to them. Uh, it allows uh, calibration between the different entities. So, for example, if you've got health and safety, this could be something that you, you want everybody to assume has equal importance. A person dying in a tiny project in a subdivision of a little business that comes as, as out on the very edges of the world, um, that person dying should be just as important, perhaps, for you as just um, somebody dying in head office. And you want that to be something that everybody's aware of. Part of the, the value of this is that you're bringing everybody into the same value system. And that's, that's pretty critical if you're going to do a, an enterprise risk management, I believe. Then, of course, you want to put your people into the system. So again, you either use a, a, an API or you enter the people's information. People are a critical part of, of Pelican. They have their own identities. They're actual people. They're not just roles. And that's because we assign responsibilities to them. And then finally, um, you import your current risk register. So probably you've got a risk register that's sitting in the spreadsheet, or you've got it in um, a, like a qualitative tool like uh, ARM at Risk Manager or something like that. And you want to you want to upscale and be, get more quantitative. You don't want to start all over again. Well, you can take all of that data. Um, you can download the template, um, which uh, the template from our Pelican system, which has got all of the information I previously described, all of the people, the entities, etc. And then you you basically fill in that, that template using your the risk you've already got, upload it, and all of those data are sitting directly within Pelican. And just to a final mo um, point about customization, something that everybody's always asking about, um, you can customize a great deal within Pelican. For example, you can have any number of risk breakdown structures that you might be interested in. You can have any number of dashboards. We give you um, um, a dozen or so different dashboards, but you can make copies and edit and new versions of the dashboards for different entities as you want. With different, we're using a graphical interface, interface with drag and drop, and you can do all sorts of very fine things with, with dashboards. Um, you can also control access rights um, and the access rights or the, and the approval um, to, to see particular type of information. Um, and you can say that a person, for example, is allowed to see just the dashboards and only for information that belongs to one particular entity or to several entities. So you can limit um, what anybody can see, what anybody can do, even down to the individual level if you wish. Although what we do is we define groups to make this uh, a nice and easy thing for you to be able to do without, if you've got uh, hundreds of users, without uh, wasting too much time. You can also define KPIs and KRIs. We use a SQL code, and there is an interface for you to very easily create your own, and so you can run uh, little uh, graphs and analyses um, on your dashboards using any KRIs, KPIs, based on internal and external data um, for, from Pelican. You also, you'll see that we've got a bunch of tables. You can change um, the, the, vis what, the columns that are visible for everybody by default uh, or individually. You can say, I really don't need to see this column of information. I just want to focus on some things. Well, you can set it up for yourself and, and have your table as you want to see it. You can set up alerts. Each individual can put an alert for a particular risk that they're interested in and say, tell me when this risk has changed. Send me an email um, and put it in my dashboard. Uh, for reports, you can create these reports you would typically uh, uh, then export to PDF or Word or PowerPoint or something. Um, you can um, create new versions of reports, uh, um, and these are templates. Uh, so you can take existing report templates, edit them using a visual interface, drag and drop, etc. Um, and then once you've finished, uh, you save it, and when you go back into that report, you can create a report, and it will just populate it with all the very latest data. So it will take you matter of two or three minutes to be able to generate the report that perhaps you want to hand out to your chief executive each week on paper if they're not using the dashboards. Um, in terms of calculations, you can define the currencies you want to be used um, um, and the exchange rates are going to be used because this is something that looks out over five years. We, we don't typically connect to an external um, uh, database where you have X rates varying every day because that's not really the interest. It's about uh, about looking out over a certain period. Um, but if you want, um, we can we can also connect it to external databases for X-rays. Um, in languages, you can select between English, French, Italian, Portuguese, and Russian, and uh, Spanish will be coming soon. And finally, just for the look and feel, you can change the, the corporate identity look of the, uh, of the software. All right. 
So that's me finished with my PowerPoint presentation. Uh, I hope it didn't take too long. Uh, and now I'm going to talk about uh, the, about Pelican. So let me first of all um, show you that here is a menu. This is a Pelican menu. I'm, I left all this stuff up here because to show you that this is just web-based, um, but I can hide my bookmark. It looks a bit cleaner now. All right. So uh, the number of different interfaces um, that you've got or different drop-down menus completely depends on who you are. So this particular person, Stan van der Bosse, um, we put him in as an admin person. So I'm pretending to be him today. And as an admin person, he gets to see all these settings. Um, only admin people will typically see these and everybody else sees some of the other uh, individual uh, sets of menus. So one person, for example, who is just uh, a technician may simply have a list of to-do items. That might be the only thing that they see, which they can look at on their phone. All right, so let's start off with the quit risks. Uh, so a quit risk is a type of risk um, which you typically have in a standard risk register written in a spreadsheet. Um, so what, what, what does one normally do? One normally says, well, um, this is the risk. It might happen uh, a certain period. Um, it, it, the impacts are going to be uh, uh, a certain magnitude and it's going to um, have a certain probability occurring and normally we talk about unmanaged to managed we look at pre and post mitigations or controls uh, and so this is a the typical kind of information you, you you you're putting in you put somebody the entity that's involved a title etc you can add a new risk within within here um, using clicking on the the new risk uh, icon and then you can see the information you fill You'll see the different classifications. These are the, the standard ones, uh, or not the standard, this is the standard one, the category, but you can add custom ones in there. So for example, you can talk about uh, location and have your own sort of drop-down list, um, nested drop-down list for location. You can talk about equipment or whatever it is. You can have as many as you like and they will automatically appear in this interface so you can put the information in. You can assign, um, if you put in a name, and then you select uh, an entity that it belongs to this risk. You can talk about the owner. You select from a list of people, whether it's a draft or whether it's a, an active risk, etc. cetera, um, the type of impact. So it could be financial, it could be delay, health and safety. Uh, let's go for, say, health and safety. Uh, okay, and then once you've done that, you, you say whether it's the same as the entity um, range in which the risk may occur. If you've got a particular start and finish date, then you can enter that in here as well. You put in a probability and you put in the impact. Now, if you notice, I've, I've changed it to health and safety. So these are the different uh, standardized uh, magnitudes of, of, of impact that we would we would enter in here. And once you've ended, added all the information, you type in your, your text, etc. it appears here. So that's it. That's um, how we enter all the information into Pelican. Um, for a quick risk. Now, this is the typical type of information that you would have um, if you use the import from Active Risk Manager or any uh, 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 any other tool, um, including your spreadsheets. But we we encourage that for those bigger risks, you probably want to write a little bit more than simply um, this is going, what it's going to look like when we don't manage it. This is what it's going to look like when we do manage it. Wouldn't it be nice to know what those controls are, who's in charge of them, and maybe even to start valuing how important those controls really are? Well, we have bow tie risks. So uh, let's have a little look at risk. Go in here and I'll show you a, a, a bow tie risk this one for example I'm gonna this is a list of book rides and this is one of those um, things where I said you could edit edit the columns if you want you can add and remove columns in here and um, so if I wanted to put a column in there not a particularly useful one um, but I can add and remove them as I want um, so I'm gonna pick this particular risk and I'm gonna click on bow ties I want to go and see what this bow tie looks like and here you see um, the strategy that's being described so the, the risk involved is the loss of a radioactive source. So I'm some company that has these radioactive sources. Oh my goodness, I've lost one. Uh, what now? Well, I could lose my license. I could get a regulatory fine. I could lose uh, uh, the calibration, recalibration business that relied on this. Um, I could have some contamination of the environment that I was responsible for. So you have all of these different consequences and you can see that these two are financial, this is uh, strategic um, and 
this one here is environmental. And there are lots of things that could end up with me losing uh, that radioactive source. Here are the different fat risk factors or drivers, depending on terminology, the reasons why this you might end up with this particular risk event. And if you've got some things that you might be able to do, um, particular controls on your radioactive sources. So these are different controls. And we can build up, um, we can build up uh, a, a bow tie diagram directly from this interface. I don't really have time to show you, but this is how we would do it. So we would just basically get in here and we would start adding, uh, adding a driver or adding a consequence or editing the information, etc. All right. Now, what, how these um, bow ties are, are normally written is that you have these drivers, the risk event and the consequence. But it, in fact, um, what we've managed to do is make uh, Pelican um, far more flexible than this. So, for example, if I just go into the drivers, the drivers are those risk factors at the beginning. I can show you, uh, if I look at this driver, that it's one driver that it's in fact has potential to cause several different uh, risk events. Now, this is a typical kind of thing that you would have um, for banks. Um, would bank have a process? So this could, the driver could be that we have to repeatedly do things many times a year. And from that, we might have several different reasons why it might go wrong. We have some several, and we have many different consequences out of it. So we have one driver, one process, and it doesn't have to be banking, could be any un number of different processes, but one process which is creating several risks, which in the turn creating several consequences. We can have a, uh, a control or a mitigation which maybe applies to several different risks. Um, so there is a many-to-many -many mapping of all this. This could be also, for example, the hot topic at the moment, is IT, um, IT risk assessment. Um, if you're familiar with uh, so the new standards that are coming out in, in IT, you'll notice that they're very much um, uh, driven by the idea of looking at these, these kind of bow tie diagrams. So we can have uh, drivers. We can also look back the other way. We can look at consequences. So we can ask ourselves if we have a uh, a, a number of uh, different consequences, or let's say we have one consequence, um, like this one here, uh, what are the different risks that could bring about this consequence? So this consequence could be that you've got some particular, um, maybe you lose a contract, maybe you lose your license, maybe um, the chief executive quits, or um, that you have some, um, you have an investigation from the FBI or something like that. Uh, so there are many different ways in that in, in which that consequence could arise and here are the different risks and those risks come from different drivers. So when you build a bow tie, you build it one individual bow tie, but if you reuse elements that have been used elsewhere, Pelican automatically recognizes it, that and it will build any particular view that you want to see. It also will allow you that if you've got one risk event or one consequence, for example, this might be the driver to another risk event. So you can have sequential risk, one risk creating an, um, or exacerbating the, the chances of another risk occurring, etc. So we have many different types of um, um, ways in which you can combine these risk events. So you end up with a really a map. And in fact, we have the ability to show bow tie maps as well. All right, so those are risks. Let's look um, at the dashboards. So what can, sort of information can we get out of, um, out of this? Well, uh, the first one is that we will have a typical dashboard um, that uh, you create for any, any specific entity. So here we have the entity is Bradford uh, Industries, and this is one of the, the home dashboard for Bradford Industries. So we, again, you can have as many as you like, but in here we were looking at these values going up and down, um, the the remaining the residual risks that um, you could have you have the potential to remove. This would be, for example, if you have a control or mitigation that's in place um, but not yet working. So we're we're intending to get this uh, up and going, and this is showing you your potential for improvements that, that you've already identified. And you can you can look at um, um, where your risks sit, split any any which way you want. Here we've got across the, the six different types of consequence you're interested in. Um, you can look at the effectiveness uh, and the status of the controls and mitigations that you're applying. You can have little um, little uh, 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 ping lines 
which will give you trends. Personally, I don't like these, but I know a lot of people do because they're extremely simple. And then you have your, your top risks, your top developed risks or your top undeveloped. These are the, um, the risks that you have um, produced a bow tie diagram for and these are not. Um, this is just one of many ways that you could, you could uh, design a, a, a dashboard. And if you go and click on any one of these individual risks, um, so I'm right mouse clicking here, um, I can go and look at that risk. So you can directly, if you're looking at the top risk, you can click on something, go and look and understand that risk. All right, so that's one in one particular dashboard. We also have something called a PI or probability impact table. Probability is probably not the ideal word, but that's what it's typically called. And you'll see here that this is a scale that um, is almost semi-logarithmic, really. Um, th this allows me to talk about the risks are that are very low probability and have even high frequency. So the, down here, this is like the probability of occurring up here is how many times it might occur within the particular period I'm interested in. And I can talk about all sorts of different things here. I can look at only financial risks um, and I can say I'm interested in the top 10 or top 20, etc. cetera. Um, I can look at, uh, and so when you see this list, you will see a um, little tap or tail. That is the difference between the pre-mitigated and post-mitigated risk. So you can see how important your mitigation strategy is. And you can also do the same thing. You can click on these um, hyperlinks and or you can click on here and it will highlight the particular risk of interest. So you can see, um, you can go and dive in and find out which are the most important risks. Um, we have risk breakdown structures. So a risk breakdown structure allows you to see um, where would where do the risks reside. So here for these risks, um, these risks are on categories, categorized, but these ones over here, that's the aggregate exposure from Europe, from North America, from Asia. Uh, I might choose to go and look at something else, uh, like different categories of risks. So we've got market, legal, tax, contractor issues, competitor op operation. You can set any of these up in any way you want, but it lets you see really where um, where your, your main issues are. There, there could be legal issues, and that could be a legal issue that relates to the environment or relates to human resources. And you can so you can cut and slice it any which way you want. We have, uh, I think, a very interesting idea, barrier ownership. Now, a lot of companies, they, they don't do everything themselves, of course. But they're also going to use external parties. So you're going to use um, contractors and suppliers and supply level risk. That's obviously very important. You want to see how exposed you are to your other third parties managing the risk. And so we're able to do that because you can enter other people into the system they don't have access to it, um, so they don't get to see the stuff from, but they can belong to other companies. And then you can see how important uh, their role is in the management of your risks. For financial exposure, we have an integrated um, um, Monte Carlo simulation system. So you can see uh, that uh, here we've got, this is the aggregate loss distribution and, and benefit if you take in, into account all of the opportunities and all risks. So we have opportunities in here as well. You can go down by different entities and see what the financial exposure might be. Um, so we've got that. You can also, uh, for example, instead of just looking at the histogram, you might want to ask yourself, well, what are the drivers? So that's not particularly interesting. Maybe we go up here. Here we've got these different drivers. Um, so the loss of market share to ICL, this is the main driver in the uncertainty in the cash flow for Bradford Medical Devices. And this is all automatically generated based on the information that you're providing. Finally, we have people in, in the standard dashboards. These are the dependence that we have on individuals. Remember I said that each individual gets responsibility. How dependent are we on these people for, to be able to, um, to, to manage the risk? And you can view it in all sorts of different ways. So I've covered the, the dashboards, the quick and bow tie risks. Um, incidents is just about recording the incidents alongside risk. And this allows you, I only have a few minutes, so it allows you to um, compare how frequently you thought certain risks were going to occur against how often they actually did occur. And that means that you can start calibrating and learning from your mistakes, etc. Opportunities is a, a very similar to risks, except, of course, that these are the things that you, you um, hope to achieve. The Might Items list is about all sorts of different things, w w either the activities around risks that you have to actually do, or um, so we might just look at that. Just let's look at uh, for one minute. Let's um, go and look in here uh, for 
to see particular risk. Now, in any particular risk, you, there is a lot more information um, than simply the information we provide in Bowtie. You can, for example, you have, um, and this goes for the simple risk as well, or quick risk, you have a, a complete record of any changes that have been made to a, to a risk. You have any notes that, that people have added to it, any documents it might attach with hyperlinks, uh, the drivers, the, um, the consequences, and any incidents. You, so you can see here a summary of the incidents. You can also, uh, here is a place where you can decide, find an alert. I want to be told when the impact score changes or the status changes. For example, it's a risk that um, gets retired. Um, I can also look at this information in both tire, table view. I can do some analytics around the particular risk. Um, the analytics uh, provide me with all sorts of information about how cost effective the different strategies are, um, the abilities of the different controls to, to manage the risk, etc. So there's a great deal, and, and this can apply for all sorts of different things. So for example, if you were looking at uh, controls, you would have the same kind of ideas. Um, let's see if I can find a control. For, uh, let's just use this one. I can go and look at that control. Here you see for control or mitigation, um, you have additional stuff, but you have costs. So because this is something you're doing to try to reduce risk, you've got these different costs, and you've got an activity log, things that people have to do. If these individuals have to do something, then it gets logged in their, in their, um, in their diary that they need to do something, and it, it, they get reminded up here when they've, they've entered the activity, which, by the way, we have a little, um, a little uh, uh, app, a phone, smartphone app, which you can use to be able to just say, yeah, I've done the job, and, and you don't have to log into the system. You can just use your app for it. Um, um, so uh, let's quickly just um, um, talk about uh, two more things. Uh, if you remember, I, I, I mentioned that you can have uh, uh, risks to do with, let's just look at that. Um, so for project risk, here, here is within Bradford Industries, you've got um, these different subdivisions or companies. And um, at the end of the chain, you'll have the project. So you can see here is a project pacemaker development. And here I can see an overview of the, uh, the baseline, what the, es what the original estimate was from when the project was completed, and versus a, a, a box plot with 5, 25, 50, 75, 95th percentiles of when we now estimate that this project can, will be finished. So depending on your access rights, you might be able to see just, um, say, Bradford Medical Devices or Tulacoma Appliances. You might be able to look at the risks associated with those particular schedules. So um, we have another application, um, which is a desktop application uh, called Tamara, if you remember. And Tamara, this, uh, this has, um, it has a schedule where you can, you can look at the Gantt chart, for example, and it's got some details in here. Um, we've added risks and uncertainties. Um, so I've already run this simulation, and if I look at the results, uh, so this takes 0.2 seconds to run. Let me just see how many. 5,000 samples. I think that's fast enough for anybody. You can see that the 95th percentile is the 25th of September. 1919. So this is for dry, closed drying. Closed drying. Um, you can see there, 25th of September is the top. You can see that number. All right. Right. So um, I'll just show you how how easy this is to update. So you can update the schedule. Um, but let's just do something really simple. Let's just go into um, the task specific risk, and you see that this risk is not included. I'm going to include it now. So I'm going to save that. So I've added a risk that previously wasn't actually in there. And now I'm just going to run, look at the results. And you can see it took 0.5 seconds to run that. Um, and then I can go into Pelican and I can just say, all right, I want to, uh, I want to uh, add information. Um, where is it? It's Tudor Current Plans. It's this guy here. All right. Um, I want to sync with Pelican. Sure. Yeah, sure. OK. Sync. Done that. OK. Close. And now we see the 95th percentile is the 3rd of October. If I was to go into here and then I was going to refresh this, you will see now that it's the 3rd of October. So you can build your own, have your project risk analyst just basically inform everybody else in the company who has the right to be informed of anything that's happened. Similarly, we have um, in, in spreadsheet risk modeling, so here is a, a model risk model. 
if you're again if you're familiar with um, at risk you'll you'll understand the kind of formula here they write risk per we write votes per it's the same kind of idea uh, it's true that our software is a lot more sophisticated but for most most of you that won't be particularly interesting but what is interesting is that we have these things called SIDs so a SID is something that's been generated out of tomorrow and is now being imported into this model and that means that this is now going to run F9 it's running a simulation using the data for in, the, in this case the duration in this case the finish dates but it also be costs could be um, any any number of different parameters that were sitting uh, that are simulated within tomorrow model we can pull them directly into model risk and we can run simulations so I'll run a simulation of this and this is going to take oh, about five seconds to run 5,000 samples when it's finished the, the results viewer in model risk pulls up and you can see all this information is is automatically all already created this is perhaps another big difference with other software tools and spreadsheets we have one one simple window interface where all of the information is shown and it's an electronic information in interface so you can you can save this information um, you can just hit save you can and then send this file to somebody and they will be able to open it and we'll see, see the exactly the same thing when they do they can it has the tool has the capabilities of just being able to do anything you like really so I could do a box plot for example add that for different things um, yeah you can do whatever you whatever you want within when within the, the electronic file and save it for yourself if you want to have partic different particular graphs now that's all lovely to be able to have um, your spreadsheet model sitting on the computer but wouldn't it be great when we're really sure that we've created the, a model that is robust we don't want anybody to mess around with the logic of it um, but we want to give people access rights to it and we also want to make sure that they're using the latest information well the easy way to do that within pelican is that you uh, you upload it to Pelican. So if you go in the QRA, quantitative risk analysis, in the models, I can add a new model. Um, I don't have the time to do that, but I can just talk about, um, let's look at this, pick a model. So within a model, you can run multiple different scenarios. Everybody can run a different scenario um, they can, if they have the access rights again. And when you've run different scenarios, you can do things like compare. So here I'm comparing. These are two simulations that were run on the same model. And you can see I'm comparing the EBITDA or whatever it is against two different options I can change this from this standard graph to another standard graph and it will show me the the different uh, the different distributions right and different all the different uh, reports 